this morning. You excited, man? Guys, how so what? Amen? Hallelujah. The song selection this morning was amazing. And guess what? I believe in Jesus. Amen? What a beautiful, beautiful song. Wow. Love it. I want to welcome you to Southside Baptist Church this morning. Now, today we're having our fifth Sunday meal. So we're here. You say, well, well after this service, well, I just have to wait around until after the 11 o'clock service. No. You can go to a Sunday school class because we have them in the next service, too. We do, we do what they call a sandwich. We have Sunday school, church, Sunday school, church. I love them sandwiches that have about four pieces of bologna on it, <laughs> about eight slices of onion, three tons of mayonnaise. Man, we're living, gang. We're living. Anyway, so that's what we, <laughs> so if you like it, you know, if they get you excited about food, we're going to have some great food. I went to the kitchen while ago. I mean, there's some amazing stuff been delivered here today. And you, if you, please stay. You say, well, I didn't bring any food. That's okay if you didn't bring any food. We'll take care of you, okay? Uh, you'll be in line last, but that's all right. You can just <laughs> <laughs> This one. And we're also at the end of this service today, we're going to have communion. That's kind of interesting to have communion on this day. Because we're not only going to have communion with the, with the bread and the, and the juice, but then we're going to commune with each other in the Lord's meal also, and in the Lord's house. Nothing be better than breaking bread together and having a, a, a supper meal with our Lord together with believers. It's the greatest thing in the world. So please stay with us if you can today, okay? This morning we'll be in some most exciting scripture. Amen. Learning to possess your possessions. Romans 7, 4. Learning to possess your possessions. But first, Brother Gilbert, this is your fault again because I got out of that book you gave me. Okay. <laughs> How do billboards talk? They use sign language. <laughs> that was a good one, no. That's good. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <I> <laughs> and here's, you can like this one better. Okay. What did the bald man say when he got a new comb? I will never part with this. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Yes. Ah, bad. bad, I know. That's, makes, that's what makes them good because they're so bad. <laughs> the thought for today is this. Most people have too little prayer and too much propaganda. Amen. If you'd pray for the people you're talking about, Come on. maybe God will help them out. Yeah. We need to pray them out of their sin. We need to pray them out of their problems instead of Say, instead of pointing fingers at them and putting them down. Okay. Let's now stand and look at Romans 7, 4. In the honor of our Lord, if you're able to stand. It says, wherefore, my brethren. I tell, so when he says, my brethren, he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers, brothers and sisters. Wherefore, brethren. My brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Father God, just this is a, this is a powerful verse today, dear Lord, in the book of Romans. Help us to, to work out, dear Lord, what, what, it, what it means to us and look at some other verses, dear Lord, and kind of, kind, of, kind of stay in Romans a little bit here this morning, dear Lord, so we can understand, dear Lord, that there is a possession out there. But many times we fall short of it and don't possess that possession that you want to give us, that you've already given us. So, Lord, just, just speak through me this morning, dear Lord. It's not me. It's all about you because, Lord, we all hear believe in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now let me go back over that bad boy again. Romans 7, 4, Amplified. It says, Therefore, my fellow believers, you too died to the law through the crucified body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, 
in order. In other words, you were saved to do this in order that we may bear fruit for God. Amen? Amen. A little boy had a dog. Oh, yeah. Somebody said, son, what kind of dog is that? Really, the dog was just a mongrel. But the little boy was proud of his dog. He said, he's a police dog. So the guy says, what if, he doesn't look like a police dog. The little guy says, well, he's in the Secret Service. <laughs> now, I want to say that to, de to, to demonstrate something. I know a lot of Christians who are saved. But I also know a lot of Christians who are saved that don't act like it. They don't even, they don't, they don't behave like it. They're not even, they do not live victorious lives. And there's something wrong. There's something missing. We're going to talk about that today. There seems to be a contradiction between what the Bible says they are in Christ and what they are in reality. There seems to be a gap. Now, you know I'm not talking about anybody in here this morning. Okay. For example, the Bible says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that we are complete in him. But how many Christians would rem th th actually remind you with their lifestyle that they are complete in him? The Bible says concerning those of us who are saved that we are overcomers. Overcomers. Many believers, believers act like victims rather than victors. The Bible says that when we are saved, we have the peace that passes all understanding and joy unspeakable, that's scripture, and full of glory. How many Christians can say with all their heart and soul that I have peace that passes all understanding? I have joy unspeakable and full glory. Jesus said, if you'll drink of the water that I will give you, you will never thirst again. So how many people, may possibly even in this congregation, would say, I am completely satisfied in the Lord Jesus? Here, here is true satisfaction in Jesus, to live this lifestyle. I'm going to read you Romans chapter 8, verse 13 in the Amplified Version, okay? For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you're going to die. What? What? But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body you will really live forever. Woo! That's a powerful verse. I love it. And we could just go on and on and talk about what the Bible says that we are. And then it'll, it's our calling through the name of Jesus Christ to show the world what we really are in Christ. It's not about what you feel. It's about what God, how God tells us to handle ourselves. So, where's the problem? I mean, there seems to be kind of a contradiction, okay? You think people are, are right in the ways, living in the ways of the world, and the Bible is wrong? No. So many people want to live just like the world, but where did the Bible come in on all this? So what must we do? Are we just to dumb down the Bible? That's what the world's trying to do today trying to water it down, trying to, try to take for certain scriptures out. You know, some people want to, want, want, when, you, when you give them a Bible, they say, well, can you also issue me a razor blade? What for? So when, that, so when I read a scripture that really bothers me, I can cut it right out of there, and I don't have a problem with it anymore. That's what the world's doing today. They want to live on their standards and not on God's standards. A bookstore manager said one time, do you know what happened to me? He said, well, a lady came in, and she wanted a lavender Bible. She said, next Sunday is Easter, and I'm wearing a lavender dress, and I want my Bible to match me. Right. I want to have a Bible, which is a great idea. 
I think it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I got to think how many of us want the Bible to match our lives instead of our lives matching the Bible. Amen? We want to somehow bring the Bible down to our lifestyles rather than bring our lifestyles up to the Bible. We're seeing it all over. We're seeing, we're seeing denominations do that, okay? On a battleground, the flag guy carrying the flag got out ahead of the regiment. A soldier said, Sergeant, the flag's out ahead of the regiment. Shall we bring it back? He says, no, bring the regiment to the flag. Amen? Don't bring it back. You bring the regiment to the flag. Have you ever watched, and I think it was the, the Civil War movies are the best ones for that, okay? Where they would always have one guy. He didn't even have a weapon, man. And they were shooting guys, dying all over them. There was about 100,000 of them ch charging. They were dying everywhere. And there was one carrying the flag in the middle. It, it, with the Confederate or the United States, whatever, they were carrying the flag. And they were out ahead of everybody. Didn't have a gun or nothing. Pretty soon, they, the, the, the guys on the other side, well, I want to I knock that flag down. So they killed the guy with the flag. And the, you'd see that flag go up in the air. He'd throw it up in the air. The reason he threw it up in the air because the next guy there would drop his gun and he grabbed the flag. And he'd run on. He didn't care about his life. It's about the flag. When are we going to put the Bible as that important to our life? When are we going to put that as the most important thing in our life? Bring the regiment up to the flag, okay? That's what we need to do in our, in our Christian lives. We need to bring our lives up to the standard that God has for us. Are we overcomers? And I'm going to look at myself. I'm, I'm preaching nine times of this back to myself, okay? Albert, are you an overcomer? Do you have peace that passes all understanding? Jesus Christ is, is made into the wisdom, the righteousness, the sanctification, and redemption for the world. But somehow, we need to bring the regiment up to the flag. And we need not to make the Bible match our lives, but we need to make our lives match the Bible. Now, what's the key? What is the answer to this riddle or this problem? Well, you need to understand that there's two key words that we have to understand first, okay, that we think about. First, the first word is provision. Provision. God has made provision for us. He has set the pace. He has set it out there. Here's your provision for salvation. Provision is the act, the action of providing or supplying something for us to use. Salvation. He's provided it for us, okay? So he has provided salvation through Jesus Christ for our own personal and special use. And then that we are to use it for his life. Now I said he has provided it. We now have to take the salvation and appropriate it into our lives. Now, the other word then is appropriation. Now, God, I want you to understand. I'm going to talk about this word a little bit, okay? Now, God has made provisions for us, but that provision does us no good until we appropriate what God has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. So appropriate means to devote to a special purpose. And that is to change our lives. That's the reason we're, we're talking today to, we need to possess your possessions. Possess your possessions. And I'll explain that in a little bit also. Let me give you another example. Remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt? They were going to Canaan. They were coming out of a land of bondage into a land of blessing. And God told Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread on, every place I have given you. Now, that's important words. I have given you. Now, not will I give it to you. No, I have already given it to you. Every place that you put your foot on, 
it's yours. It's already yours. I've ordained it already, okay? Now, it was theirs. But guess what they had to do? They had to go in and take possession of their possessions. They had to take that land. It's yours. I'm going to give it to you. But you got to take. So they had to fight for years to acquire the possession that God gave them. See, when you become a Christian, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy street. You have to fight to serve the Lord. Sometimes you got to fight temptation. You have to fight people turning your back. You may lose family members, best friends. But until Jesus is your best friend, you're going to have problems. Because see, when he's your best friend, then the other friends don't make no difference. I love you. I'll be your friend. But that's all right. I've got a best friend, man. I'm going to possess my possession is Jesus Christ. God said, I have given it to you. Now go in and take your possession. Are you following me here right now? Brothers and sisters, I pray you are. What I'm trying to tell you is that you have so much that you have not possessed yet because of doubt, because of the world, and because of different things. There was a, a story. I tell the story every once in a while. There was a guy that died and went to heaven. Old St. Peter was walking him around, showing him how cool. Man, his my, oh, I can't believe all this, okay? You know how a tourist looks. And so he's looking, and he says, he sees this big, massive warehouse about 17 miles long. Biggest thing you ever saw in his life. He says, what's in there? He said, Peter, you don't want to know. <laughs> yes, I do. He said, I, I, I want to know what's in there. He said, no, you don't want to know. Well, come on, just take me. He said, okay, I'll take you in there. So he goes in there, and he sees for miles shelves, perfect shelves, and they have these big boxes, storage boxes on the shelves for miles. He says, what's in those boxes? And Peter says, you don't want to know. You don't want to know? He says, yes, I do want to know. He says, he says well, he says, look down there. He said, there's names on every one of them. And he said, there's, there's a name. On, there's your name right there on that box. He said, well, what's in it? He says, you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. He says, yes, I do. He says, okay, you want to? So he opened the box. He says, these are the blessings that God tried to give you and you never accepted. Amen? Amen. Amen. Kind of what we're talking about. They never, we never possess our possessions until we step out there in faith. There's, there's God's provision, but there must be your appropriation. We must take it, accept it, and take it. Now, it doesn't matter what God has done for you. If you don't appropriate it into your life, it does you no good. How many of you now... Be honest with me, have books in your house that you have not read. One, even one book in your house. And the rest of you are lying because I know you have one, okay? okay? I got several books I haven't read. I bought them and I haven't, haven't got to them yet. Well, you know, you, you've got books, but you haven't read it yet. Now, are those books yours? Yes? Unless you borrowed them somebody, well, if you haven't returned them, you've, you, you know, you stole them, but that's all right. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't possessed your possession yet. You know why? Because you ain't never opened up the book to find out what's in it. Amen? Amen. It does you no good to just sit on a shelf. So, but, but ha we have not appropriated it into our lives. So remember, on the one hand, there's a provision. He's given us the provision. On the other hand, we must appropriate that into our lives. Some people know, Satan knows every word of the Bible, front, back, up, down. He can quote it a million times better than you ever thought you could quote it. But he won't obey a word of it. He will not appropriate because he hates the Lord. He hates us. And the way, the way the, what Satan wants to do, he wants to take you to hell with him. That's why he tries to keep you away from accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's why he tries to tell you, oh, the world is better. Oh, go ahead and get your gusto here and don't worry about it. Oh, you better worry about it. So remember, on one hand, you got a provision, and the other hand is an appropriation. Now, with this in mind, in Romans 7, we're going to learn how to appropriate. We're going to learn how to possess 
our possessions. First of all, we, learn, we, learn, we must learn dying and start living. We must die to start living. You say, how's that? All right, now, that's the first step. We kind of talked about this last Sunday, okay? We learn to die and start living. Maybe you need to write that down, okay? I need to die before I can start living. And that's not contradictory at all. You will never, did I say never, Judy? Did I say, thank you, sweetheart. Did I say never, sister? Yes. Did I say never, sister? You're good, sister. You will never, I even put emphasis on it, okay? Possess your possessions until you die to yourself. You got to die to yourself. Jesus must be more important to you than your own life. I believe in Jesus. He is the Son of God. See, we talked about this last week, but we must, we must die to sin, self, and Satan. Now you say, well, I don't want to die, Pastor. Well, I, you know, I don't, I'm not that excited about it either. But until I learn to die to myself, then I will start living for Jesus. Die, and that means dying to the old ways that were running contrary to the word of God. And you know, a cross is not for just wearing around your neck. And they're nice, and I love them. I saw a real pretty one this morning. But you know what the cross is for? It's for dying on. Always remember that cross is for dying on. So you die to the old person. It's the old person that dies so that you can become a new person in Christ when you're born again in the Spirit. So Jesus said, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall find it. Amen? Amen. So when we were, we were little boys, we used to play finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Remember that one? Well, how many times have I told you that God works things backwards, okay? Did you ever play that? Well, with Jesus, it's keepers, weepers, losers, finders. Amen? Amen. Keepers, weepers. You keep it, you're going to weep. You keep to yourself. You, you don't accept Jesus. But when you lose yourself to Jesus, losers, finders. Because you find happiness that passes all understanding. Now, so when you lose your life for his sake and the gospels, then you will find it. Now, I'll admit, nobody wants to say, I want to die. I understand that, okay? You know, everybody wants to go to heaven. Amen? I understand that too. But nobody wants to die. Isn't that kind of right? You know what I'm talking about? But you got to go through something to get something. Like I've always heard many times, People say, well, I got something. I got that free. No, you didn't. Somewhere, down the line somewhere, someone paid for that. No matter what it is, no matter you don't have any bragging rights, free is given to you by somebody who paid for it already. Salvation is free, but somebody paid for it so that it can be free. You have to go through death. To go to heaven, death to self. You have to go through death to yourself to get a victorious life. I can tell you right now, I got saved about, I accepted the Lord about 24, 25 years, I was about 25 years old. You know, you say, well, how come you can't remember the age? It don't make any difference. Hello. You know what makes a difference? I accepted the Lord. That's it. it don't make any difference where. It don't make any difference how. It don't make any difference when. It makes the difference means I did. Amen? Amen? So don't worry about all that simple stuff which guys can't remember anyway. The, the chicks, they remember the hour, the minute, the, every step they took. They remember everything. They're everything. How deep they went down to baptism or water. The whole thing, they were measuring it. You know, all that kind of stuff. And us guys, who cares? We don't know nothing. I can't remember nothing. Anyway, but I do remember one thing. Something came into my heart and changed my life. Amen? Forever. I'll never be the same. I don't want to go back to that old Albert. Amen. 
We have to come to the end of ourselves and learn dying to self so that we can start living. Now, the second thing, stop trying and start trusting. Stop trying and start trusting. So let me illustrate this to you, okay? You're going to go on a flight somewhere. We just flew last September when we went to England, and we saw my sister for the first time. I'd never saw her in my whole life. And uh, so we got on this massive, gargantuan airplane. because the jet. I mean, it had five rows in the middle, three rows on both sides. That thing must have had five, 600 passengers, plus all our luggage. And you know, when you go, you get right at the 50 pound limit. So that's a lot of luggage. All that weight. How does it get in the air? This thing's gigantic. It weighs tons and tons and tons. Well, let me explain to you a little thing, okay? So, so you think it'd never get off the ground because it's held to the ground by a certain law gravity. Okay? Certain law. But there's another law. It's the law of aerodynamics. And somehow, the wind flows over those wings and gives a lift to this monstrous thing. And you can get, get on that thing, and it weighs tons and tons and tons. But then there's another power that is greater than the law of gravity, and that power lifts the monster <laughs> off the ground. Now, the downward pull in your life is like gravity. Satan wants to pull you down in life. But there's a new law. There's a new law. And it's the law of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That passes all, that will lift you up out of the mire. He says, I'll put you up out of that mire. I'll set your feet upon a solid rock. I'll make you a new person. Romans 8.1, it says, and to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen? After the Spirit. So when you say, oh God, I can't, I can't. You never said I could, but oh God, you, you can. And you always said you would. And now, Lord, I stop trying. I'm starting to trust. There's a neat old song. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I love that song. That's all I know of that song, but I love that song. And when you stop trying, and you bow your head, and you say, I can't, oh wretched person that I am, I can't do it. Then you confess, Lord, I put my trust in you. Then at that time, the law of the Spirit of Jesus Christ makes you free from the law of sin and death. And that's what we, know, we must release. And the third thing, and this is a good one, and this is oh, <laughs> quit crying and start praising. Uh -oh. Amen? Amen? We got too many prune faces in the church. We ain't lost. We're not going to hell. We're going to heaven. If you believe that, put a little smile on your face once in a while. Hello. This ought to be the happy place, uh -huh. the joyful place. And it's getting that way. It's getting that way. You know, Prunesville is out there in the middle of 1604. No, get out in the middle of the lane. That's Prunesville. Now, I would be found in there because more cars come. They don't care if you're there. They're going to run over you. That's what the world wants to do. But Jesus says, I don't want to put your feet on a, on a, I want to pull you off of that. Mm -hmm. We often said, our smoking section is in the middle of 1604, right there. That's where you smoke at, and I was just kidding, okay. <laughs> Roman, oof, okay, probably lost 10 members. Okay, Romans 7, 24a says this, wretched, miserable man that I am. Just the A, just the part, just let that sink in. See, this, this can be a confession. I'm, I'm, and this is Paul saying this. This verse will help you quit crying and start praising. And in Romans 7, 24, be amplified. Who will rescue me 
and set me free from this body, this corrupt mortal existence. In Romans 7, 25a, thanks be to God for my deliverer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. Man, that should have been hollering, jumping, praising everywhere. Just now. Anyway. So begin to say, God, you didn't save me to have me live a failing life. Amen. I don't care what situation you're in, you can still praise the Lord. Amen. And you can always find somebody across the street that's got it worse than you. Hello. Always. Always. Lord, you saved me that I might have a victorious life. Mm -hmm. And Lord, you gave it all to me. And now by grace and for your glory, I, Lord, am going to possess my possessions. Amen. I'm going to take the joy of the Lord and put it right here in the heart. Amen. You know what? Would you happen to, uh, what would happen if every one of us in Christ were to really lay hold on to the possessions that God gives us, has already given us, and not bring the, you know, not bring the flag back to the regiment, but bring the regiment to the flag. Not get, get a Bible that will match my life, but get my life to match the Bible. And in conclusion, we're not going to keep it long today. Everything I've said today is for Christians, for believers, for brethren, it said, for sistren, okay? And this is not for an unbeliever. This is to lift our spirits to where, so we can possess what he's actually given us, already given us through our salvation experience. So, because you know something, no unbeliever can live a victorious life, the kind that we know, the one that's going to go to heaven. They cannot live it because they don't have it. No believer can have the Spirit of God in them. You've you got to be saved. You must be born again, as the Bible says, you must receive the gift of salvation through and only through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be asking, Pastor, would Jesus save me this morning? Oh, yes, he will. Pastor, are you certain? I tell you, I am certain of that. If you were to come to Jesus in repentance and faith and ask him to save you and he didn't save you, I'd close the Bible and I'd walk out the door and never preach again. But I believe it with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength. Because you know why? One day it happened to me. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. And your salvation experience, your testimony is the best. Like Nacho Lieber says, it's the best. Okay. <laughs> so I'm telling you, you listen to me. He will save you today. He will keep you saved if you trust in him. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. All of us were in the same bucket. All of us were lost sinners one day. All of us. Until Jesus came into our hearts. Amen? Amen. And come short. It says, and all of us, and we come short of the glory. That means you're, you're just short of going to heaven. Mm -hmm. You may be the best old boy in the world, the best person in the world, best chick on earth, but if you don't have Jesus, you ain't going. That's the Bible. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being hard on you. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. You must be saved. And once you're saved, you don't need to go back into that lifestyle of sinfulness anymore. Come on up out of it and match the Bible to your life. Yeah. And throw them sins back behind you. You say, well, it's hard. It is until you release it to Jesus. Because I do believe the Bible says I can do all things, all things through Christ. And it doesn't say I can do all things through Albert or through Southside Baptist Church or through, this, or through the meal we're going to have. Oh, it's going to be good. Uh, it says, I can do all things through Christ. There is no other name. We have no other name for you here at this church. Christianity has no other name but Jesus Christ. No one can save you but Jesus. 
Romans 6, because the wages of your sin is death, eternal separation in a place called hell. But the gift of God is eternal life. Uh -huh. Woo! Man, I'm excited. My toes are curling. Okay. Mm. Through how? Again, there's that name again. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. I believe in Jesus. He is the Son of God. Amen? Amen. How about, what a song this morning. Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us. That's all of us. All of us. And now while, while we were yet sinners, there it is again, Christ died for us. There's no other name. I'll never give you another name because there is no other name. To give you another name or another way, I would be lying to you. I ain't gonna, I'm going to tell you the truth because the truth set me free. He set many of us in here free. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I'm standing at the door of your heart. He's standing at somebody's door right here this morning. I'm knocking on your heart. And if anyone hears my voice, if you're listening to Jesus right now, you're saying, I want to trust Jesus in my life. He says, I'm going to, and, and you, so you open the door of your heart. I'm going to come into you. Woo, man. When he comes in, he's going to change your life. You know why? Change mine. So that's why I can stand up here and tell you about the love of Jesus. Because why? He showed me his love. And I guarantee you, man, I was just a lost sinner. I looked cool. I thought I was cool. I had a nice, pretty policeman uniform on. I was really cool. But you know something? Uniform is not going to get me one inch closer to heaven than anybody else. Because the one in that, body, in that uniform was lost. If I'd have died on that police force, I would have gone to hell until I said yes to Jesus. If I'd have died over in Vietnam on that ship I was on, Brother Gibbert would have died in Vietnam and he served over there in Vietnam. Without Jesus Christ, we'd have gone to hell. We'd have gone to hell. I don't care what kind of soldier or sailor you are. I don't care if you're the best human sailor of the quarter every month. You're the tip-top sailor. If you don't have Jesus, you're going to hell. That's the truth. That's the truth. He says, if you open the door, I'm going to come into you. And boy, did he ever come in. Since Jesus came into my heart. Amen? Amen. And we'll sup with you. I've been feeding on Jesus for 50 years. And he with me. Amen? Keep feeding on him. Keep the excitement of the salvation in your heart. And that, it'll automatically... See, when your toes curl for the excitement of Jesus and they curl down, all the muscles and the, the, the dumal flitches in your body, they pull you, and they, they, they just, they get, they get excited, and it pulls around this way, and it comes here, and it hooks here, and it pulls it up. You got to smile. It's just, it's, it's a genetic truth, okay? Anyway. Now, don't go home and Google it, because you ain't going to find it, right? Romans 10, 9 through 11. But the Holy Spirit can do that to you. And if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in that heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you, I shall, you shall be saved from going to hell. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. So with your heart, not with your brain, and with the mouth, Lord, I trust you as my Lord and Savior. I'm changing my, I'm coming to you. I'm, giving, I'm trusting you. Trust and obey. Whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed or shamed. And then, of course, our most powerful one, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever, if you're here today, you can, we're all the whosoever. Some of us are the whosoever's that have already accepted Jesus, and maybe there's some here whosoever's that haven't accepted Jesus. And this message is specifically for you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved from going to hell and go to heaven. Father God, we come to you this morning.